Welcome to ATDC Radio. I'm Jane McCracken, Assistant Director of the ATDC. We're the state of Georgia's technology business incubator. And I'm so pleased you can join us for this month's installment of our podcast, Take Five. Yes, it's a play on the Dave Brubuck jazz classic, Take Five, where we ask two of Atlanta's leading entrepreneurs to talk to us and share five things that have impacted their entrepreneurial journey. It could be people, places, events, books, music, just about anything. We want our guests to take five and share them with us. Joining today's broadcast are Robin Gregg, CEO of RoadSync, and Brian Daly, the co-founder and CEO of Ground Floor. And to get us started, I'm going to set the scene and borrow from the lyrics of Take Five. Wouldn't it be better not to be so polite? You could offer some light. Just share a little conversation now. It's all right. Just take five. So let's learn about the five things that have impacted these two entrepreneurs' journeys. Robin, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about RoadSync and um, share the first thing that's inspired you. Oh, good. I get to share one. Yay. Um, my name is Robin Gregg. I am the CEO of RoadSync, which is a platform for logistics companies to easily digitally invoice and accept payments from pretty much anyone. Um, so we help service providers, trucking companies themselves, everyone remove paper from their business processes. Uh, the transportation industry is a $700 billion market where a lot of the business is connected with paper. Uh, you do a paper phone call to get paid. You uh, might have to, uh, get to do, you might have a paper payment, a paper invoice, a paper check. Um, and it's just a really clunky way to do business. So we're making it more efficient and more consumer like. So kind of like square before the trucking industry. Um, my first take five item is I really love a book. I think everything in life is a negotiation. Um, and so I really love this book that it is written by Christopher, Christopher Voss, who I think was a professional negotiator for, I can't remember if it was the CIA or, or, or some, some entity like that, um, called, uh, never split the difference. Um, and it talks about tactics, uh, for how to, uh, negotiate more effectively in a variety of different uh, situations. He was a hostage negotiator, so hopefully I will never have to negotiate over humans. But, you know, if, every, if you think about everything that you do, business transactions, um, getting my uh, seven-year-old to put on long pants in December, all of it is a negotiation. And he does a really good job of helping you figure out tactics for doing that. How did you come across that book? Was it recommended to you or did you just find it somewhere? I don't know. I feel like maybe it was like an internet rabbit hole. Um, I might have been looking for something and I just uh, stumbled across a video with uh, with him talking about it. It might have been like a, a Google, I don't know, on-site session or something. And, and I just was intrigued by it. And uh, it's very, very readable. Um, you know, sometimes nonfiction can be a little bit slew, but it's, it's, it's really fascinating because he obviously intersperses some interesting stories about his negotiations. Wow. That's on my list now. I'll read it. Brian, how about you? Tell us about Ground Floor and something that's inspired your journey. Well, Ground Floor allows everyone to build wealth through real estate. Uh, and it was born of a fundamental uh, observation and allergic reaction to the idea that uh, – you know, 95, 96% of us don't get access to invest in the same things that the top two, three, four percent uh, do. And in an era of uh, Occupy Wall Street back in uh, 2011, 2012, when we were starting to think about some of these ideas, uh, we realized that there was a gap in most of our portfolios, which is the opportunity to invest the way that the banks do, uh, the opportunity to invest with less volatility, less risk. And here's the thing, uh, more control. Because whether you uh, actually believe people are smart enough uh, or capable enough uh, or not doesn't actually matter because they behave as though they are. Uh, and we realize that and we give uh, investors the ability $10 at a time to take a position in one or most people invest in uh, hundreds, if not uh, coming up on thousands now, of real estate investment loans that pay yields of 8, 10, 12% uh, 
uh, and you get your money back on your loan in about uh, 12 months or less. That enables us, that source of capital and that product enables us to make real estate investment loans uh, to entrepreneurs all over the country who are uh, buying real estate investment property. And we partner with them much like a, a venture firm would partner with a startup, you know, to help finance their venture uh, with a loan. That's great. And you've been at it a few years now and you've been challenged by regulation. You've also done some innovative things around fundraising. I wouldn't mind just tapping into that a moment sure. before we ask you for your five. Well, we started the company actually seven years ago next week. Oh, wow. So we incorporated January 28th. What is that? Uh, 2013. Uh, so we have been at it a while. It's been uh, quite a ride, lots of twists and turns. We did, we, we raised early stage seed capital. Uh, that is always an adventure for anybody who has done it. Uh, you know, that's one stage. We, in 2015, raised a $5 million series A round from a local venture capital firm, which was, uh, hugely constructive. The joke at the time was, uh, you know, Fellow founders were, you know, congratulating me and saying, well, you guys must have really grown your revenue a lot this year. I said, oh, yeah, we did $40,000 in revenue. They're like, oh, 40000 a month. That's like half of the monthly revenue that you would expect for a $5 million Series A investment. I was like, no, 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 40000 since inception, you know, for the year. Uh, so we were fortunate, you know, to – uh, we'd achieved an important regulatory milestone that with the Securities and Exchange Commission that allowed us to sell this product to everyone, not just to the accredited two, three, four percent in the country. And it was based on that milestone that fortunately RVC saw the opportunity uh, and made the investment. And that really set us off to expand nationwide. Uh, from there, we realized that uh, we would drink our own Kool-Aid at some point. And uh, instead of raising VC for our next round, we actually uh, raised – now going on $12 million total from uh, over 3,200 individual shareholders uh, who now own, own about 20% of the company. So we've um, we crowdfunded the equity of the company starting in 2017, and uh, that's how we financed our growth, uh, now to over $6 million in annual revenue uh, and 52 employees. That's fantastic. So share with us something that's inspired you on your entrepreneurial journey. Well, I, you know, I, like a lot of people, uh, when I got out of college, I, I wanted to come up with an idea. Uh, and so my best friend and I spent a lot of time uh, in Chicago, probably too much time, thinking about ideas. And that was, you know, I got out of college. I'm an old guy. I, I got out of college in 1993. So, you know, there wasn't, uh, you know, Eric Rees and a, <laughs> and a business model canvas and a whole process of creating startups uh, than like there was today. We never really got to an idea where we had conviction, but uh, the I think the place that really uh, changed things for me was, um, you know, many years later, uh, many entrepreneurial experiences later, I had a really pivotal one uh, when we started Republic Wireless uh, as an internal startup inside of bandwidth. And I had, I'd been part of founding teams where we'd been seed funded or part of a management team where we had a series A and I was supposedly taking a break from that kind of uh, very stressful activity and volatility to uh, get quote unquote, a real job. Uh, and that real job turned out to be an internal startup that, uh, you know, that the way that got started and the way that that developed and the way it took off taught me a lot about myself as an entrepreneur uh, how to provide opportunity for other people actually uh, who are entrepreneurs. And it was, uh, I, I think ground floor wouldn't have happened without that experience and, and the way that it unfolded. Go into that a sure. little bit more about like how you inspired other people and kind of join you on that particular well, internal startup. Actually, the inspiration was given to me uh, by an, a really important leader uh, in my career, David Morkin, who's the uh, founder, co-founder and CEO of Bandwidth, uh, the company that I joined. I was very fortunate to join there, and it's a wonderful company. It's now public, uh, publicly traded on NASDAQ and um, really well-managed firm, great culture. Uh, I was really proud to be part of it. Uh, they had hired me as a 10-year veteran of the wireless industry to help them start a wireless division. And, uh, you know, their market was small and medium businesses. And so, you know, I showed up, employee number one, to start a wireless division and build a line extension to their existing small and medium business telco product 
uh, in wireless. We did a deal with Sprint. We did all this work and we got it launched and it just didn't take off. And we're having a board meeting and this was very instructive to me. I, I'll never forget it. We're sitting in the board meeting and I was going over the results and we all admitted, you know, that they weren't, they weren't great. You know, they were fine. You know, we could build a fine business, just steady growth. And I was challenged by David to say, you know, well, what else could we do? And I said, well, we have some technology for Wi-Fi that we've been working on. He knew about that and that the company had been working on that. We have some ideas for how we could use that, but it'd be a totally different direction. Uh, and it'd probably take us two or three years to commercialize it. And he looked at me after hearing the idea from our team and said, you know, I want you to go back as a group and ask the question, what would happen if we had to make this happen in two or three months, not two or three years? And it was so motivating to have somebody like the idea enough and have trust and faith in us as a team and me as an entrepreneur to send us off to go and do that. A consumer product that the company had never done before, uh, you know, a completely different direction, a crazy idea, and to be given permission to go form a team and break it off from the business unit of 20 some odd people that we had at the time and go create this from scratch internally was just, I mean, it was, a, it was intoxicating. It was awesome. You know, and David did that for me uh, with his leadership. And that's what that culture was all about, really. But he he really walked it in that moment and and we seized it as a team. We, we ran with it. I mean, we, we, it was crazy success at Republic Wireless. Well, I was going to ask you yeah. what the end of the story was. So congratulations well, on that. Success. Well, thanks for that. Uh, well, the success became my undoing there eventually because uh, anyone who knows me knows that uh, I'm just not cut out to, you know, lead a division of a, you know, somebody else's company. Uh, at some point you realize you're a founder and you can't, you can do good uh, entrepreneurial work inside of a company, but it is fundamentally different from being out there and being a founder from zero to one. Uh, and for me, I think uh, I got to a stage where I think it was at the, at the point when um, I realized I, I realized my wings were as an entrepreneur were being clipped necessarily. So I needed that. It was better for the company and we just agreed it was time for me to move on. Uh, and that, you know, that was a hard thing because Republic wireless, I felt like, you know, it was my baby. And you, and I become very attached to what I do, but it, it, that experience in a very positive way became the underpinning for what we did at ground floor. And some of the early team members who joined us at ground floor came out of bandwidth with the company's support. I'll add that. I didn't steal the employees. Uh, that was, that was with their support. And so, uh, and in fact, bandwidth was, uh, although when I asked David about this, he said, no, as a policy, we don't invest in startups made, you know, created by former employees, but uh, I'm happy to mentor you and support you. Well, con contrary to, to David's pronouncement a year later, they were part of the first round, uh, oh, wow. part of the first money. <laughs> so, I mean, we were very blessed. I was very blessed to be there, very blessed to uh, benefit from David's leadership. Uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, gratitude for that experience. It was really amazing. Great. Thank you. I think one of the cool things about that story, and I don't know if I've had leaders that did this for me too, which is when you ask for impossible things. So you went back to him and you said, Hey, it's going to take two years or three years. And he's like, Oh, do it in two months. We're like, like what? Yeah. But it's like, it, it creates this creativity yes. to ask for impossible things that I've learned from some interesting leaders in my career. Yeah. And, it, and the way he did it said not, you could see somebody saying that in a way that was very threatening. Yes. Like your job is on the line if you can't figure it out, right? But that's not the way he said it. He said it in a way that told me I could tell that he knew that we could do it, that we had all the talent we needed. We had all, you know, and, and he would support it, you know, and, and it was up to us to just go, you know, kind of get out of our own way. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, that's very inspiring to me, you know, and I, I find myself asking that question too is like, where am I in somebody's way or where is there something in somebody's way that I can light that fire for them? Even if it's not a ground floor, even if it's somewhere else, you know, like that's okay. Yeah. Um, I totally agree. It's when that happens in your career, it's, I mean, it's, exciting. A, it's a gift. Robin, do you, can you recall somebody that kind of gave you that kind of 
inspiration? I mean, you know, it might have been a little bit, I won't say it's in a threatening way, but I, I think I learned, um, uh, I spent quite a bit of my time at, at Fleet Corps, which is, um, which is now a public company here in Atlanta area. And I will say one of the things that the executive team is very masterful at, and one of the things that I learned there was asking for impossible things. And not impossible as in like no way impossible, but like, it, it was always – we, we always got stretched about 25 to 50 percent beyond where we thought we could go. And just even the thought exercise of, OK, you said you could do 20 percent growth. How would you do 50 or how would you do – how would you double just made me a better entrepreneur today because that's what you're asked to do constantly. You're asking to do seemingly impossible things, conjure up businesses out of thin air. It's literally what we're doing. And, you know, to have had been mar- marinated in this thought process for seven years on, okay, okay, Robin, you, you know, 10% is comfortable. How do you do 30, 40, 50% and really making you ask yourself, could I do it? Could I do it? What would it take to do it? And sometimes you get to the answer, no, I can't. It's not possible or here's the barrier. But even that's helpful because you realize, oh, well, I should go in a different direction or maybe I should seek out this different opportunity. Um, so I think organizations that are run that way and really try to constantly stretch themselves are high performing. And you know, I think that was a lesson that I learned and, and I think has been a really important one for me in my entrepreneurial journey. And so do you find yourself – Stretching the team you manage now? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we we do a lot with very little. Um, we try to keep our burn pretty modest. Um, you know, we and, – and, you know, t- I think we – I'm constantly having the conversation, Robin, that is not possible. Oh, no, 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 it is. What would you need? What would unlock it? Could we try it a different way? Do we do a different partner strategy? I mean, there's always – it forces you to explore all the angles. And I think you just can't be a fast growth, a highest achieving company you can be without constantly asking yourself that and sort of looking for the the opportunities in all the corners. That's great. So Brian, what about something else that's inspired your journey? Uh, well, I, I, for, let's see, 2009. So until I turned 38, and I'm 48 now, uh, I was an atheist. And in 2009, 2010, I had a whole bunch of developments in my personal life and professional life that caused me to challenge that atheism. And I had to, at some point, humbly doubt my doubt, which was hard for me because I was a hardcore atheist. I was recruiting people <laughs> to, to, to believe what I, you know, believe what I believed. And I would have rejected the idea that it was just a belief at the time. Uh, and I didn't just have a flash where I came to faith, but I did, uh, I did go through a process and in that process, very humbling It was very humbling intellectually. Uh, it was very humbling within my family, with my friends. Uh, but I was intellectually honest enough to go through it. And I don't think there's just no way, uh, I could have undertaken this what I did at Republic Wireless, I was just talking about, or at Ground Floor without that change uh, that was wrought of that sort of period of intensive sort of deciding to doubt my doubt. And that it was a very humbling thing to do. Uh, but as entrepreneurs, we are humbled. And, um, you know, you do realize uh, anybody that's been through it and will look at the, the, the idea of entrepreneur as hero is a lie uh, that's born of our sinfulness is – human beings. I think, uh, entrepreneurs are helped. And, uh, if you don't know that you're not doing it right because people are helping you, even if you don't realize it. And I think the, um, that process of coming to faith for me 10 years ago was really critical in, in forming that part of my entrepreneurial, uh, way. Well, I'm curious, you described it as a process. It was a process for me. Yeah. Um, that indicates a certain amount of time invested yes. and activities. Yes. Introspection. Yes. Thinking. Yes. Uh, well, the, the hardest moment for me was uh, when I decided – I didn't even believe in God, but I had to pray. <laughs> I, I just decided. I'm like, all right, people say this works. I'm going to give it a shot. And I had to admit that it 
it, I had an experience, but I still wasn't willing to believe. I really needed to go research and read. And uh, I read, I think the most convicting book beyond those of, uh, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis was a, some good friend of mine who was a Christian uh, and knew me intellectually uh, and professionally turned me on to C.S. Lewis and a few other writers that really sort of made me engage my brain in the process. And uh, one of them is uh, The Case for Christ by uh, John Stossel, that uh, you know, guy's a journalist and a lawyer, uh, pretty difficult uh, apologia to overcome. Uh, for anybody who's looking at it with a sense of intellectual honesty. Uh, and so for me that um, it was a process. It took, I don't know, six months or a year before I just decided, okay, I'm going to accept this change in my life. And uh, I've never looked back. I'm, I'm a unrecognizably different person. Um, I'd like to think I'm a much better leader because of it. Much better human being. I, I know I'm a better entrepreneur because of it. No question. Thank you. I mean, that's, Pretty personal, and I appreciate your sharing that. And I, Robin, I know that's a hard thing to follow I know. up. <laughs> but, I, dro- I dropped the Christ bomb on you. Sorry. I know. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things about me that I wanted to share was that I, I think where I'm from is really has been really impactful. So I um, I grew up in West Virginia. Um, which is not known for being one of the wealthier areas of the United States. Um, I was, uh, you know, went to public schools all the way through. Um, I'm the first person in my family to get a bachelor's degree and, um, you know, really grew up part of, uh, a very, um, very loving, supportive community that, um, where people didn't have a lot of advantages. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, um, a lot of people dropped out of my high school. The graduation rate was quite poor. Uh, the teen pregnancy rate was quite high. And, um, you know, I was one of the few people who actually left the state to go to college. And growing up like that, I think, has given me perspective that has is really important to me. Um, I think that I – have been constantly reminded that, that, um, the struggles that people go through of, of various kinds. And, um, I think I'm more, um, empathetic to our customers. I mean, the customers we serve, I and mean, we're serving the transportation industry, about 7% of the United States is in the industry. And, you know, their lives are hard. I mean, if you're a truck driver, you might be spending 200 days a month, a year, not a month. That's too many in a month, 200 days a year away from home. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hard life. You're sleeping in a cab. You don't, you may not have a lot of money. You're trying to send it home. Um, you know, the day-to-day struggles that folks experience are very real. And I think to have grown up in a community like I did, which was, you know, a, a beautiful part of the country. Um, my parents still live there. I, you know, I, I'm very, I think it was, a, I had a great childhood. Um, so I think of it very fondly. It was not like I had a hard upbringing at all. But I do think I have a great, greater sense of perspective because of wh- where I grew up, and um, don't do not take for granted the advantages and experiences that I've had. And so I think to echo what what Brian said, entrepreneurs are helped. You know, I've been helped every step of my career. I am on a very unlikely path. I mean, I should not, I should not have gone to Harvard Business School. I should not be running my being CEO CEO of my company. I should not have achieved a lot of the things that I have. It's just, it's, you know, very, very unlikely given where I've started. So I I would not have gotten here had I not been helped all along the way. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly reminded of that. And I think it's important to kind of have that perspective and be grateful for what you've been given. I also appreciate just how much you're relating your experience to your customers and really being able to bring that personal experience to appreciate your customers and what you can do for them, how you can help them and understand them. So that was great. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to kind of look at um, parts of the economy that are less or even just, uh, you know, different types of businesses that are less sophisticated or less technology forward. I mean, you know, I'm not selling a product to digital marketing executives. I mean, it's just, it's just a different marketing segment and some people, you know, could look at that and be disparaging about it and be like, oh, I can't believe they don't use smartphones for everything or, you know, can't believe they're not always on the internet. But like, 
they're not. And it's just the reality of how they conduct their business. And, you know, their needs are different and their li- business lives are different. Um, you know, they – they worry about getting in an accident and, you know, it just, it's, it, it's just a different, you just have to have a pers- different perspective. And if you don't care about your customers, it's difficult to serve them well. And so I think it's, it's important that we understand who, who we serve and, and have some genuine affection for them. And did, did some of that affection for your customers and really understanding your customers, you mentioned Fleet Corps, did you kind of pick that up from there along the way? Yeah, I mean, before I joined Fleet Corps, I'd always been in consumer related payment products. And, um, you know, serving a consumer market is totally different than business financial products. And, and so one of the things I got acquainted with was just, um, you know, serving sort of more blue collar businesses. Um, and I think that that, you know, I did get affection for that. I just realized how underserved they were. And that, you know, they just really weren't being brought best in class tools or financial products or software. Um, and that they were often overlooked. And it's because they're, I mean, they are hard to reach. It's hard to, harder to make things usable for them. Um, you know, people, it, it just, you know, it's, it's not as, I guess, you know, it hasn't traditionally been as sexy as, as serving other markets. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that, but it doesn't mean that they are worthy of any other of, of lesser products. And, and today that's kind of the situation. I mean, what you're doing for your customers and enabling them, making them more efficient, better at their businesses is, is really what it is about. I'm curious, though, when you mentioned your upbringing, it seems like someone who has grown up in the way that you described and then went on to certain types of education that you've been able to achieve may not have gone the entrepreneurial route. They may have just stayed in the corporate world. How in the world did you decide to kind of take that risk? I, um, so, I mean, I felt like this was something that if I had not had the chance to do, meaning running or starting my own business, that I would regret it. And that I felt like to fully experience um, what I wanted to do professionally, I wanted to have an opportunity to build and grow and lead my own business. I really wanted to do that. And I thought my best chance for doing that was to um, start or come close to starting my own thing, take something really, really small because it would have my thumbprints, my fingerprints all over it. And that's what I really wanted. I just really wanted to build something and that love of it was sort of outpaced the need for security or the need for comfort. Um, and I don't know, in some ways, I think because I I feel like so much of what I've achieved has been a very lucky and fortunate gift that, you know, why not try this? I mean, it's, you know, the rational part of my brain said it's, it's you know, they, you can always go back. I could always be it, it, get, find a corporate job, hopefully, knock on wood. Here's the truth, though. Yeah. You won't. I know. I never will. <laughs> But I could, right? Isn't that that's what I tell myself? Okay. I could, but um, but I yeah, I wanted to have this experience. It was really important to me to have the have this experience, and I um just was really excited about doing it in this space. That's great. Now, Brian, how about you? Something from your past that's driven you to this future? Well, I I will first say, Robin, what you said about your customers, uh, I think is motivating and beautiful. And it's something that we talk about with our customers too. I can relate to what you're saying because, you know, you think a real estate investor, it's probably somebody well healed, you know, well off, you know, sophisticated. And sometimes it is. Uh, but a lot of the customers we deal with, this is their livelihood. Uh, they're, they're feeding their family with their real estate investing. Uh, and you know, they've pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and they're not, you know, we, we talk a lot about implicit bias around the office and we have a very diverse team. Anybody that worked alongside of us here at ATDC will attest to that. You know, it's a, it's a team that biases older. Uh, it's racially diverse. It's, it's diverse in many, many ways. And that's reflective of the fact that our customer base is diverse. And I think it's hard to identify with people if you're not, if you don't have some voice in the room that comes from there. Uh, and so I, I think the way you said that is really, Awesome. And I can relate to it a lot as an entrepreneur. Um, I think it's great. I, I, uh, I was at, uh, Harvard Business School in the 
mid nineties. I started in 95. I finished in 99, uh, not cause it took me four years to do a two year education. It's cause I was also doing a law degree at the same time because I promised my parents when I was 12 that I would. Uh, and I did, uh, while I was camped out there, the dot com boom was happening. Uh, you know, we had classmates who were off, you know, raising venture capital and selling startups for lots of money. <laughs> and it was kind of, I think there were 19 startups that were funded in the class of 99 coming out of HBS and oh, wow. people were just like, what is going on? You know, all this series, all this venture. Now it would sound like, you know, barely a pre seed round or something, but we thought it was a lot. Uh, and so I had the opportunity to participate in a bunch of entrepreneurial projects while I was in school. That's how I spent a lot of my free time and some of my academic time. And one of my first ones I think was really important for me in my journey. And I think some people who are listening to this might uh, relate to it or have questions about this. I had a, uh, I learned a co-founder lesson, uh, in my first venture. It was cleverly called caveat emptor, which is Latin for buyer beware because we were. Uh, <laughs> That's so perfect. I think that URL is still available. I should have just kept it. Uh, but caveat emptor.com. It was a place to buy your used, uh, law books and case materials at Harvard Law School and a few other area law schools. We're profitable from day one. I'll say that. Uh, but my co-founder and I realized we just weren't cut out to start a business together. And I learned a valuable lesson that uh, was reflected when we started Ground Floor. I started had the good fortune of starting with my co-founder, Nick Bargava, uh, who I met you know three or four months before we decided to, to start it. And I learned two things about that. Everybody talks about how important the relationship is and having the right complementarity. And that's true. Uh, and that's been true for us. And, you know, you got to check that out. I mean, we met each other, significant others. We spent lots of time together. We, you know, took questionnaires about, you know, co you know, being co-founders. We were very intentional about it. But the other thing that we did that resulted from that early experience being a co-founder and it not going well is people think the value in their early days is, is the value of the enterprise comes from, you know, the, reputation of the entrepreneur or the idea or the market size or the intellectual property. And it's none of those things. None of that means anything at the earliest stages, unless the people doing it and better if it's two than one are fully committed to it and committed in a sort of irretrievable way. You have to put your pencils down on everything else you're working on. And that is the hardest thing to do as an entrepreneur. And that's why, in the earliest days, that's what creates the value. When you're at zero and two people decide, nope, I'm not doing anything other than this, that's when the value starts. And I think that was a valuable lesson for me to learn back then because we were distracted by all kinds of things. It was the mid nineties. You know, we were, we were both in law school. We we're both in business school. I was newly married. I mean, it was a mess, uh, but we got that right with ground floor. Nick and I both, you know, January 28th, 2013 said, okay, this is it. We're doing this. We're committed to it. Uh, and that, and that's where I think in, in most ventures where the value really starts to come from the early stages. I'm curious how you met Nick. Cause a lot of people always ask how they meet their co-founders yeah. or how to find a co-founder. Right. I, uh, I, when I finished at Republic wireless, the first thing I did is I went down to the, we were, we were Republic wireless was based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, uh, I sought out, you know, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the triangle in North Carolina, which is an awesome ecosystem. Uh, we started ground floor there before moving to Atlanta uh, a year and a half in uh, five years ago. And we, um, I, I was volunteering at an incubator. And the reason I was volunteering at the incubator is because I went to a, a pitch coaching session as one of a handful of entrepreneurs who was invited to, to go and offer feedback to the entrepreneurs. And I just, I, I couldn't stop myself from, you know, raising my hand and providing, you know, some feedback and some help. And I just found that very motivating and it ended up volunteering at this incubator and the managing director of the incubator at one point pulled me aside and he said, I know you're working on an idea. And I'm like, me? No, no, not me. He said, no, no, no. I want to hear about it. You know, and I whiteboarded an early idea that was related to ground floor. And he said, I know just the person you need to meet. Uh, he's a technical expert in this area he has lots of big ideas in this area. You guys will, will, I don't know whether you hit it off or not, but he's the right person. And it was true because Nick had worked on the 2012 jobs act and without his regulatory vision, uh, in work, 
uh, we wouldn't be where we are. No, no way. Uh, and so that was a critical introduction, but it's because I showed up to an ecosystem. I participated, I volunteered, and then eventually, uh, you know, as ecosystems do, they connect you to the resources you need. You mentioned entrepreneurs are helped. They so are. That incubator manager certainly helped you guys. John Austin at, uh, Net, well, now it's, it has a different name, but it was known as Groundwork Labs at the time. Uh, John Austin still to this day is a good friend of the company and of mine. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Robin, how about you? Some other things that have inspired your entrepreneurial journey? I have a very similar, uh, my first sort of experience starting something is very similar to, um, to Brian's. So, um, in, I guess like 2008 and nine, I lived in Tampa Bay, Florida, and I met, uh, I was working at a, a company called Revolution Money. It was another startup. Um, and I had an idea that you could put, uh, barcodes for your, all your loyalty cards on your phone, um, which now has existed for quite some time. But at the time that didn't exist and apps, applications in the app store were very, very, very new. And I had a friend who could whip something up and like we did it sitting at a beach bar in St. Pete Beach. And we had, we had both of us had kids crawling around on our feet at the time and had other things going on. Both of us had other jobs. And he made this app and we called it Wallet Zero and it allowed you to upload your barcodes for your loyalty apps onto your phone and you go to CVS and have your phone scanned to get your loyalty card rewards. And it worked usually. I mean, it was was definitely (laughs) – it was definitely not that uh, flawless by uh, – and we launched it and became a top 100 app in the app store. No money. We didn't – like he just did it and I just – I. Got somebody on Craigslist to do a logo and I bought a URL and I mean, we probably spent a grand total of a hundred dollars and, um, really it started to get some momentum. We had tens of thousands of users instantaneously with, with no push whatsoever. People really wanted this thing that only sort of worked. And he and I looked at each other and we're like, okay, so who's going to quit their job? <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> Not me, you know, and so it, it, it was this reckoning, right? To your point, like you really do have to, both people have to commit and we, we struggled with it. We're like, well, maybe we'll find someone else to run it. Maybe we'll put money into it. Like we came up with 10 different scenarios, but I think the fact of the matter was neither of us, like it was a novelty to both of us. Neither of us were particularly interested enough in the problem. Like we didn't feel like, like I didn't feel like spending any life savings to make sure people could like have their CVS rewards card. Like that just didn't feel like fulfilling to me, although it was clearly working and there was an opportunity there. Eventually actually another company ended up doing the same thing and they got sold pretty quickly for, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars. So we we could have done something with it and we never did. Um, And we just kind of let it go. Um, I think it still exists. You can actually look it up. Um, You know, it's, it's still kind of out there in the ether, but um, you do have to commit. Like both parties have to be excited about the problem. You have to commit yourself to it. And it has to be something that, you know, part of my entrepreneurial journey to me has been like just hanging in there. Like you just, sometimes you just have to not quit is the key, right? It's not about, you know, necessarily getting to the next milestone. It's like not quitting, <laughs> you know, just, you know, it, it, just having grit, um, is, is really about, a big part of it, just being too stubborn. I mean, I've just been at many moments, you know, I I think sane people would have, would have let go and you just can't, you gotta, you gotta hang in there and that's how you win. Sometimes you just the last person standing. Yeah. Well, where do you guys find your grit? What, what makes you do it? A huge personality flaw. (laughs) (laughs) Giant one. Plus Uh, one. (laughs) I, I um I worked for a person uh in Silicon Valley at, after I graduated you know I thought well I because I was in school 4 years I had a a mortgage and no house uh you know I owed my lenders over $200,000 paying for my 4 years of graduate education and uh you know I was newly married went out to Silicon Valley got a got a real job and it was awesome uh, in a lot of respects. And I, I worked for a couple of people who were really influential to me in a lot of ways. And one of them taught me this lesson that we're talking about, which underlies grit and doing something that you really care about. 
uh, I worked for a guy named uh, Thomas Reardon. He's actually now an entrepreneur in uh, in neuroscience. He has he has a an amazing company that was recently featured on sixty Minutes that allows your brain to control things. I think it's in fact I wish I could remember the name of the of the company. It's amazing. Uh, it might be called Control. CRTL, like the key on a keyboard. But anyway, uh, Reardon was fascinating to me because he came from, uh, you know, the Windows 95 team, which became the Internet Explorer 3 team. And he and a couple of his compa- compatriots are the guys that, uh, you know, if you watch some of those uh, documentaries about how Netscape got dethroned, uh, they were the guys doing that. And so these were virulent competitors, uh, very, very smart. And uh, I learned a lot from that guy. Uh, tough boss to work for. But one of the things that he taught me related to this topic of grit that I think is important is you have to not only decide what you really care about, but then you have to wear that on your sleeve. You have to do it. Uh, And that's a tough thing for a lot of people to do to care that much. And then even if you care that much, admit it. Uh, And he had his own, you know, passions and, and whatnot that he, uh, you know, espoused and was very clear about with our team. And I think people followed him through some pretty difficult battles at the company that we were working for, uh, because of that. And I watched that and he, he used to sort of in, in a tough way, he used tough love. He used to, you know, kind of shake me. Cause I was like a, you know, what I was an HBS guy. I was the MBA, you know, a lot of times people in Silicon Valley would lampoon MBAs back in the day. I don't know if they do or not today. They still do. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, but I was also, you know, his right hand guy helping him on business stuff, which I'm sure he appreciated at some level. Uh, but, but the truth is like he, what he was trying to shake me out of is out of like the safety of corporatism or of, you know, the, the comfort of not admitting what you really care about or really digging deep enough to care about something. And I took notes on that. I mean, and and as an entrepreneur, it really, it disturbed me, honestly, at first, because I thought, well, maybe I don't care about anything at that level. And I always thought of myself as someday wanting to be an entrepreneur. I was like, Ooh, maybe I, I won't be, or maybe I won't be a successful one because if, if I can't do that, how am I going to attract people to go do these things with me? Because the truth is not only do you have to have grit, you have to have investors who have grit. You have to have early employees who have grit. You have to have customers who have grit. You think being a customer or an employee or the first money in at a startup is an easy gig? No, that all sucks. I mean, people talk about how being a founder is tough. All of those jobs are hard also, and they all require grit, and it, and it has to come from the person who first has grit you know, sort of the founder or the co-founders. And uh, that's tough, man. I, I'm glad I learned that because I went on a soul searching journey over time to figure out like, what do I care about? Do I care about anything enough at that level that will propel me forward? And what I noted about that guy uh, is, I mean, he's worked in a wide variety of fields and it's because of what he cares about. It's a consistent thread. And I, I think that's true in the entrepreneurship that I've embraced too. Uh, and it's made a big difference. I think you have to find something that you really, really care about and that other people are going to be attracted to. Uh, you're caring that much. And it's tough to admit. Tough to do, tough to admit. How about some closing things that have impacted you, things that have inspired you? One last one, Robin. Um. We talked about grit and a little bit of mindset. And um, one of the things I would encourage folks t- is to make sure that you all have the help you and support you need and seek that, be it a coach or a therapist. I've had both. I have, um, you know, resources here at ATDC that have been really helpful, like you, Jane, other entrepreneurs like Brian. I mean, it liter- this would have literally been an impossible journey without the support of people around you. And so, you know, you kind of keeping sane and perspective is a real challenge, especially when you're asked to do hard, impossible things. And so 
seeking that help wherever you can, you, you need it and can find it. And it can probably come in different forms. Um, is there's no shame in that. And so I think that that's one of the things that I think has been really important for me to know to ask for help and to not just realize you're being helped in your journey, but also that you need to ask for it. And in some cases pay for it <laughs> in the case of professional help, like whatever it takes, you should, you should pursue that. And I think it's just important to, for people to realize there's, you know, no shame in that. And actually you'll be better for it. That's great. Brian, how about you? Uh, okay. Here's the truth. Nobody gives a shit about your crappy little startup. That's the truth. Uh, and now that sounds horrible because I used a bad word, uh, and it's a bad concept, but here's the truth. Nobody cares about it. Uh, and that's a good thing because, uh, when you realize that realizing it is a good thing, because when you realize that the corollary to that rule is when you find someone, a customer, an early employee, a co-founder, an investor who does, who thinks your idea and you carrying the flag for that idea is worth devoting their time and money uh, and career to, uh, you value it more. You don't take it for granted. And I think it, the hard thing is to realize that you are alone. You do have to reach out for help. But when you get it, know that that's a very special thing. And you have to nurture that. You have to honor it. You have to show gratitude for it, have gratitude for it, because the people who fail are the people who think their idea is obviously good and everyone's going to love it. And of course you're going to invest in me. No, 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 that's not true. There's only a few people who are going to see it the way that you see it, especially if your idea is any good. You know, there are only a few people who are going to see you for you and take the time to do that. And when they do it, you got to respond to that. And so it's a, it's a rather rude way of sharing that truth, which is, you know, have gratitude for what you get because you really aren't entitled to anything. Uh, and um, when you get it, you know, appreciate it, make something out of it. Well, thank you. I think we've had some interesting themes coming out of today. I heard the need for grit and a lot of stories around that. Certainly the need for passion in what you're doing. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Seek it. You can't do this alone. And be very grateful for the people who are going to help you along the way and support you in your business at the passion level that you have for it. So thank you, Brian Daly from Ground Floor and Robin Gregg from RoadSync. I appreciate your sharing and taking five with us this afternoon. And I hope everybody will stay tuned for next month's Take Five.